was a traditional evening prayer. Pious Jews would say it before going to bed. They would address God, they would address him as Lord, and they would pray, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was a simple prayer. Even the youngest in the family could soon learn to pray it for themselves. Some of us are of a generation and we remember something similar. Maybe you remember it. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. One level, those last words of Christ were a simple nighttime prayer. Could be understood by everybody who heard him utter those words from the cross. On another level, Christ's words were a direct fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Each of the seven sayings from the cross are fulfillments of Old Testament scripture. Uh, For example, the first saying from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, was a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 12. We saw that. The central cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Taken from Psalm 22, verse 1. And this last word is taken, as we've already sang from it, uh, Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Now, Jesus did not quote all of that verse. He himself is the Redeemer. Uh, But he submits himself to the same Lord, the God of truth. He commends his spirit into his Father's hand simple prayer, a scriptural prayer, and also a Sabbath prayer, by which I mean a prayer of rest. Uh, God rested from his work of creation on the seventh day. He declared it to be very good. And this final prayer of Christ before he lays down his life is number seven out of seven uttered from the cross. It's the perfect end to the perfect seven. And as the Lord utters these words, uh, light is once more dawning light is flooding the earth again those three hours of darkness have now come to an end on that good friday afternoon there was that supernatural darkness in the middle of the day but it's now passing there now is a second supernatural dawn a new day has begun indeed a gospel day has begun a day of grace and as This new day is ushered in. Christ prays. Redemption is accomplished. And it is very good. The day where redemption will be applied to all the world. It has just begun. And so as we look at this prayer this morning, let us uh, keep in mind that these words of Christ, they're not just his last words before his death they are also the first words of a new day of a new time a new era these words are not just words to die by they are indeed words to live by notice three things about this prayer of christ then please first of all it's a prayer of communion communion father he begins He begins those final words from the cross the same way in which he spoke first from the cross. He looks to heaven and he prays, Father. He prays as the Son. He prays as the Son once forsaken. Uh, that central cry out of the seven sayings from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that darkest moment, just before the second dawn of that Good Friday, the Lord Jesus Christ refers to his eternal Father as my God in that central cry. And in his humanity, which was never desensitized by sin, for he had none, he cried out with raw emotion and heartfelt pain, Why have you forsaken me? How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. The 
hymn writer there, he tries to catch a glimpse of what's happening in the midst of all that awful darkness. The union between God the Father and God the Son. That is an eternal union that can never be severed. But Christ as our sin bearer, he became sin for us and as such God the Father cannot have communion with him. What communion is there between light and darkness? Between the thrice holy God and the sins of men? as they are placed upon our Saviour. For those hours of darkness, between the sixth hour and the ninth hour, the Father turns his face away from the Son. You know, it's a truth that we can't really fully get our heads around to try and fathom the mystery of what's happening in that forsakenness between, between Father and Son. We would be trying to unravel really the, the Trinity itself. We do have those, those words of Jesus as he expressed his forsakenness of the Father. But now in the seventh, in the last saying, that darkest moment, it has passed. The cup of God's wrath has been drank by Christ. Hell has been endured. Our sins have been punished. Every sin laid on him fully paid for by our Saviour. And now come the, you know, the last three sayings of the cross, and they come quickly. Because from the ninth hour, the, the light, it, it's dawning again. After the cup of wrath is finished, Christ prays, or he says, I thirst. And when all is fulfilled, he says, it is finished. In our words this morning, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Darkness is over. Father's face is turned again towards his only begotten Son, and he is well pleased with him. What Christ has accomplished, what he has finished, it is very good. And from the words of Christ, we know even at this point that communion is restored. Even before God declares to all his satisfaction with Jesus by raising him from the dead, here we can see already he is smiling upon his eternal son. The communion is fully back. And Christ says, Father, full and glorious communion with God the Father. We hear it here at the cross. Yes, the scene, it looks so pitiful to the eye. But when we hear those final words of Jesus, when we hear him pray, Father, we can be sure this is not a scene of abandonment and rejection forever. The story of the cross ends on this perfect note. Communion restored. Yes, Jesus bore the full weight of God's wrath at Calvary for my sin, for your sin, believer. But that was not the end. Before he breathed his last, Christ bore the full love of God once again. Even there with all that spiritual uh, exhaustion that he had as the God-man, even amongst the physical and emotional anguish that he suffered, Christ was sure of this. Father loved him. Because of the cross, to all who receive Christ, to those who believe in his name, we too have the right to be called sons of God, the children of God. As believers, Christ has instructed us to pray, our Father, even Abba, Father. The same communion with God, it's available for every Christian. We too, as believers, can be sure of this love of God. No matter what the circumstance. What are your circumstances like this morning? How's your week been? How's it been for the last month, six months? What's it been for like the last year? Some have gone through great trials. Some have suffered great pain. Some of you are kind of still in the midst of it. 
There are times when we can feel forsaken by family members, kind of let down. Sometimes it's just the pain of losing somebody who's been so very near and dear to us. Maybe it's the circumstances of your job being under threat. It looks like you're for the job and you're just nervous. The trials of life, they, they, they come at us. Uh, they can cut us deeply. But whatever, whatever trial that you're called to go through, whatever cross you may have to bear, as you listen to Jesus pray, even in the very worst circumstances you can be sure of the father's unbreakable love and you can have real communion with him often it is when the trial is at its hottest that we can find the closest communion with the lord shadrach meshach and abednego would tell you that they're there they're cast into the fiery furnace but they knew the sweetest communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was literally right there with them in the midst of it. Or Paul and Silas in the stocks, in the inner prison, and they're singing hymns. They're suffering for the sake of Christ, but there's joy in their hearts. That There's a communion there which, which cannot be broken by the jail and by the chain. David in Psalm 23 verse 4 Yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil For thou art with me Your rod and your staff they comfort me So no matter what Believer no matter what you're going through Have faith in the son of God Who died for you on Calvary So when you're looking unto Jesus You can be sure of the Father's love. Actually, nothing can separate you from that love. Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ faced all of that. All of those things in Romans 8, he suffered them all. And yet still he was assured of God's love. And even in the worst circumstance, he prays, Father. We do have to notice, though, that that communion is not automatic. Christ was sure of it. Because he prayed, not taking, not making time to pray, so then you know already what will happen. Your assurance will begin to crumble, and you'll wonder, does the Father love me? But here we learn when we make the time, we take the time to pray, even in the heat of trial, then yes, we can be sure. Of the Father's love. Christ prayed a prayer of communion. And believer, we've got to pray it. We must pray it too. Secondly, see that it is a prayer of confidence. Into thy hands. Into thy hands. The, the confidence that Jesus has in his Father's hands. There is no safer place. He entrusted his own mother to John. Jesus' body would be entrusted to Joseph of Arimathea. But his own spirit, his own eternal soul, he entrusted that to the Father. Let me digress just for a moment to us so that we're clear as to what Jesus is talking about when he mentions his spirit. Question 22 of the Shorter Catechism, very clear. It asks, how did Christ, how did Christ being the Son of God, become man? Answer. 
Christ the Son of God became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. Being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. Christ was a real man because he took to himself in the incarnation both parts of man. True body, reasonable soul. His body, as prophesied, would not see corruption in the grave. And his soul, or his spirit, he committed unto his father at the point when he laid down his life. At that point, just as in our own death, body and soul separated for a time until the resurrection. Jesus, if you remember last week, he was sure that he would be at home in heaven that same day. Today you'll be with me in paradise, he said to one of the thieves. Not only sure of the, the Father's love, but he was sure of the Father's ability to take care of his soul and bring him directly to heaven. Hands he could trust. You know, the Gospels they, they do make that contrast between the hands of God and the hands of sinners. Matthew seventeen twenty two. And while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and the third day he'll be raised up. Luke nine forty four. Let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. In Gethsemane, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Luke 24, the angels by the empty tomb. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. <coughs> when Peter preached at Pentecost, Acts 2, 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Hands of men, sinful, lawless. They lead Christ to the slaughter, but he submits himself willingly to that torture and cruelty that he may accomplish their salvation. But here, at the cross, at this point, those hands, they have done all they can all the plotting and the scheming, it's reached its zenith. The, the sentencing and the mockery, it's passed. The, the whip, the crown of thorns, the nails, the spear that has drawn forth his blood. Those sinful hands can do nothing more to him. They, they, they are finished now. And now in these final moments, he entrusts himself into his father's hands. Hands of God sinless hands hands which uphold the law Isaiah 53 verse 10 makes it plain that it was the hand of the father that struck the most severe blow upon the Lord Jesus yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he has put him to grief and even after all the hell that Christ endured for our sin all that wrath of God which he drank fully from the cup the cup that the father gave him he still turns to his father gives himself completely to him the father's hands yes they had been severe upon him but he trusts his father Surrenders everything to him, even his soul. He is sure his soul is in safe keeping. Psalm 121, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. And so into thy hands, it's, it's a prayer of great confidence. Christ knew all was well with his soul. Hebrews 9, 27 says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. And yet for Christ, the judgment came first. He's unique in that. And he bore it all. And all that remained for him was to die and to join his father in glory. And he's 
so confident of his father's happiness. Do you have that confidence? In your father's hands? For you and I, death will come before judgment. Do we face it with that same confidence as Jesus? You see, we ought to when we're here. When we're at the cross. Because here we see, he died for me. He died for sinners. He's my representative. He's my head. He said in John 10 verse 29, My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. we can have that same confidence because Christ took our judgment for us. Am I afraid of the judgment? Come to the cross. There's my judgment because I'm trusting in Jesus. And my judgment has it's, it's already been taken place and the verdict has already been given. My sin that's already punished once and for all. So when the believer dies and we stand before God, the judgment is altogether different. You know that the writer to the Hebrews continues on in the next verse. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin salvation See, that's our confidence Christ the judge will return but for those <coughs> trusting in him as their saviour the judgment's already over and for them it's just the fullness of salvation so our confidence can be fully in the hands of God fully in the hands of the son of God who died for us took our judgement do you have it? have that confidence and if not then come to the cross again and see Jesus and do not leave the cross until you've asked him to be your saviour, to take your sin, repent of your sin and cry to him, put your confidence in him, nothing else will save don't trust your eternal soul to anyone or anything else only entrusted himself to God the Father we must do likewise Stephen in Acts 7 verse 59 when he was being stoned to death very similar prayer he's praying to the Lord Jesus Lord Jesus receive my spirit and again it's not just for death it's, it's for all of life to have confidence in the hands of God Are you in his hands? Something we see, don't we? If you walk through a graveyard, safe in the hands of Jesus. Are you safe in his hands now? It's for life, not just for death. Have confidence in him. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Prayer of confidence. And finally, a prayer of conquest. I commend my spirit. He's laying down his life. No one is taking it from him. He's laying it down of his own accord. Jesus said that would be the way of it. John 10 verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. This is the victory of the cross. The power of Jesus is not at a low ebb. He alone has the power to lay down his life and the power to take it up again. Now, for the sinner, God's promise says the soul who sins will die. 
Hebrews 8, 18, 20. But for the sinless Son of God, death has no power over him. And as he hangs upon the cross, death itself, death would not dare come near him. Death has no right to touch Jesus. But in his final words, Christ tells death, if you like, what to do. He summons death, that he may defeat death as the last enemy. He deliberately and willfully laid down his life so that death would be swallowed up in victory. As he commends his spirit unto the Father and breathes his last, it doesn't look like a great military victory. We are tempted to see defeat. We're tempted to see a, a broken man with only a few words of consolation for his own soul. But actually, this is the victory of God's redemption. The Lamb of God must be slain. The begotten Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, he must, he must take our place and die for us. Never was so great a battle fought and won in such a way. Colossians 2.15 Having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. You see that's the victory that we get to share in as Christ's people. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 to 57 Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to apply this victory to every Christian in the next verse. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord Christ breathed his last he defeated sin and death therefore says Paul live your life in the light of that victory be steadfast and unmovable and get working for the Lord because work for him is not in vain you see that's the thing isn't it that the unbelieving world just don't really get they don't understand it they might walk past here this morning they might glance in what are they doing in there it looks like a kind of meeting in vain it's not going to change the world Others thought that as they walked past the cross on Good Friday. You know, after all that wonderful teaching of Jesus, after all his amazing miracles, now he's crucified. What a waste. What a needless death. A death in vain. A death for nothing. How wrong they were. The death of Christ is everything. It is the perfect once for all sacrifice for sinners. It is the love of God poured out on the world. It is the wrath of God poured out on sin. It is the central moment of all history and it is not in vain. And because of that moment, you and I are now called children of God. Because of that moment, you and I are rescued from sin and death and we have everlasting life. And because of that moment, we can now live the Christian life steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, not in vain. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. They're not just words to die by words to live by don't we need to pray it more often if we're to 
to live the life we need to pray the prayer prayer of communion to the Lord it gives rife give, gives rise to life a life of communion with the Lord a, a prayer of confidence in the Lord gives rise to a life of confidence lived with the Lord and this prayer of commitment to the Lord gives rise to a life of conquest with the Lord. May we learn to commit our way unto our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven, we humble ourselves before your throne. Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves before your cross. we're amazed you gave up your life for us Lord I pray that we would trust you Lord we know we can but we are wayward we often put our trust in ourself in our wallet in our family in a million other things oh please help us truly put our trust in God so Lord Jesus we commend ourselves to you we thank you that body and soul we belong to Christ and Lord we commit ourselves unto those hands that have made us that have saved us that shepherd us today those hands which one day will bring us home Father into thy hands 